climate change, or MPA, Mobile Polar Anticyclone. Alberta wildfires, May 2023. Be fire smart. May is wildfire season. Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society. Today I'd like to talk about the current conditions in Alberta and the wildfires that are going on. Um, this is about current conditions which can change quite rapidly. So if you are in any area of the province that may be at risk, please check the Alberta Emergency Alert Line and don't rely on the information in this um, explainer video. This is just about the background information related to wildfires. It's not about what you should be doing right now in terms of any emergency alerts. So please check the Alberta Emergency Alert Line to make sure what's going on in your area if you're watching it right now. So um, this is uh, recorded on May the 13th, 2023 at about noon. So conditions can change quite rapidly. Please make sure that you check the Alberta Emergency Alert site for information. And as of May 13, 2023, the forecast conditions, as you can see on the fire weather map here, um, are extreme. So please avoid any activities that could spark a fire. The Alberta government is asking that please do not fly recreational drones near fires because they can interfere with the firefighters. And people should be prepared with a 72-hour kit in, in the event that you have to be evacuated. And you can see this is a really large area of uh, a few provinces. So... Um, people should be prepared and make sure you have enough fuel in your vehicle to travel. So that said, we shouldn't be surprised when there are wildfires in May in Alberta, although the international press always seem to think that it's some kind of um, surprise. It's not. And of course, climate activists think that it's all about climate change. And Bill McGuire is a professor in the UK. He's written a book about the world burning up. Um, so I tried to uh, send him some information about the causes of wildfires. And he said that's not relevant. Global heating creates the conditions that make wildfires form more easily and spread faster. How they started is not the issue. And uh, this young lady says that this is climate change and that it's an apocalypse just before Edson. Of course, it is horrifying, it's terrifying, but um, the real problem in all this is the more we say that it's climate change, the less we do practical things to either be prepared or to prevent these kind of extreme wildfire conditions and uh, the extreme risk to communities and individuals. So as long as we're pretending that putting up wind farms and solar panels will save us from this kind of um, uh, wildfire activity, we're deluding ourselves and putting people more at risk. And I'll show you why as I go through this presentation. Uh, also, my voice is a little raspy today because, of course, there is a bit of wildfire smoke here and there across the province. <clears throat> so, of course, as soon as the wildfires took off, global TV was right out of the gate with eco-anxiety and its impacts on younger generations. And so media is fueling climate hysteria on wildfires rather than giving us practical information. And the person they chose to interview was young Sadie Vipond, who's a 17-year-old high school student in Calgary. You may recognize the family name, Dr. Joe Vipond, uh, was, uh, is a member of uh, the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, and the CAPE activists pushed coal phase out in Alberta, and I believe this might even be young Sadie as a child. Um, and you can see that all the health unions in Alberta were very keen to phase out coal. And thanks to coal phase-out, in 2022, Alberta had seven 
grid level 3 alerts, which means blackouts are imminent. So uh, the pool price tripled since 2015. We're short a thousand megawatts of dispatchable power, meaning the kind of power generation that you can uh, easily add more to the grid or reduce. And uh, the six month uh, average pool price has tripled uh, as of June 29th, 2022. I haven't updated it lately. So that's what we predicted, that it would triple the power rates. And uh, sure enough, that happened. And we did a report about that time called In the Dark on Renewables. That might be useful for people to read and understand why renewables send your power prices through the roof and make your grid less reliable. But in fact, uh, the premise of phasing out coal was that we would get rid of a lot of PM 2.5, that being these little tiny particles. But in fact, what happened <laughs> is that wildfires emit a thousand times uh, the PM 2.5 that coal plants ever emitted. This is based on emissions data from 2011. And it was part of our report that we wrote at the time, burning questions. And at the time we said billions to phase out coal will be billions diverted from healthcare. And that's exactly what has happened. This is the report that we wrote at the time that looks at both wildfires and uh, coal phase out and the relative risks of each. And one of the things noted on the cover is that electricity was recognized by the UK Department of Health as the most vital of all infrastructure services because without it, most other services will not function. And the Cape medical people advocate for higher price power, the most vital infrastructure for modern medicine. So my tip is don't listen to climate activists on wildfires or power generation. Now let's look at the wildfires. So this was Edson at the time of evacuation. These images come to us courtesy of KK via H. So that was really happening right then and there, and it is terrifying. But ironically, you know, this is the kind of information that I would think that global TV and other media should present front and center to first of all help calm people down and secondly, make them aware of risky activities. So the reason why fire hazard is highest in spring is the snowpack melt actually creates evaporation, which leads to drier conditions. Spring weather conditions, there's a lack of rain between early March and late April. So that has a big impact on increasing wildfire fire hazard. You know, that's between snow melt and spring rain. So if we don't get spring rain in a timely fashion, then uh, we end up in this very serious situation. Of course, because the weather is nicer, more people are outside on their ATVs or their dirt bikes, um, maybe having a little campfire, um, maybe burning off some grass in their own backyard or doing mechanical work outside where there might be a spark. So all those things can lead to a runaway spark and then a runaway fire and there's lack of moisture content in the plants and coming out of winter through the natural cycle of freeze and thaw it leads to dry plant conditions so once you understand that these are the reasons why we have spring fires that helps to calm people down and it helps them understand to be very careful if you're going outside to do things be very very careful so again, I just want to show you some statistics from the uh, Canadian Interagency Forest Fire Center. These are historic ones so that it can help us get a bit of context. Just to show you that May is wildfire season in Alberta. And uh, these are actually uh, national statistics. But fires by week, you can see that May fires are almost on a par with some of the months later in the year when we normally expect to have wildfires. And May fire starts can be extremely high. So this was from 2016, and you can see what the average is, but that was, of course, the year that we had the um, um, Fort Mac wildfire. So um, the stats were higher. 
and May 18 fire starts. This is 2018 oh, versus the 10 year average. So you can see here that 10 year average is pretty high and the May fire starts are pretty consistently meeting up with the average. And this is by day. And fires by week, again I put a block here around the May fires and uh, 2018 is the blue bars, 2017 is the red bars. But again you can see many of the fires in May uh, are comparable, fires by week are comparable to other times of the year when we expect it to be wildfire season. So May really is wildfire season. Now, May fires start between snow melt and spring rain when conditions are very dry. So you can see in these fire weather maps <clears throat> that so in, in the first one, which is uh, April 28th, you can see that some of the monitors are probably still under snow because they don't even show. And then you can see that suddenly it starts to show how dry it is and how that takes off. So that's May 28th, or sorry, April 28th, 30th, and May 1st. You can just see how it spreads in terms of dryness and risk. Now this is the flat top fire complex uh, report. This relates to the Slave Lake wildfire of 2011 that was caused by arson, actually. But they did a very thorough analysis of that big, big wildfire. It was extremely damaging, very expensive. Many people's properties were burnt up completely. Um, and one of the things that they found is that the crews should be ready by April 15th. And to that point in time, I think that many people in government had thought, well, and the public had thought, well, you know, wildfire starts later in the year, so we can prepare by June or something. But they're saying, no, be ready by April 15th. Now a complicating factor that we have in Western Canada that some other places in the world don't have is that we had a mountain pine beetle infestation. So this is from 2012. It's from uh, Natural Resources Canada. We have about 18 million hectares of standing deadwood in the form of mountain, pe mountain pine beetle damaged uh, trees. And you can see in this image, which is also from uh, the Natural Resources Canada website on this topic, all this sort of reddish haze that indicates these dead trees. So of course there are living trees amongst them, but these dead trees are a tremendous fire risk. Once fire gets in there, no wonder it'll take off. Now this is not a mountain pine beetle deadwood tree. This is one of my favorite trees that was felled last year in a big storm. <clears throat> but I wanted to show you the branches and how they would have been hanging down toward the ground. So if you have standing deadwood and the branches and needles are down toward the ground like that, whoosh, you know it's just a ladder for the fire to go up to the top and then leap across to other parts of the forest, um, especially if there's more deadwood in the forest. So you can see this combination of tremendous winds which we've had along with the dry, dry conditions. You know, it's really a recipe for disaster. But here's why these wildfires are not climate change. Climate change is about changing the patterns of regional weather over 30, 50, 100, and millennial timescales. So on May the 6th, 2023, this is what the fire risk looked like in Alberta. But on May the 6th, 2022, it didn't look like that at all because we'd, it was a moisture year. And even 26, 2016 Fort Mac wildfire extreme dry conditions turned calm by June. So, you know, that's a tremendous difference. But we had a lot of rain in, in um, late May, early June. And it completely changed the wildfire outlook. So what's been happening is that, um, according to Brigitte uh, vanvliet Lenoir, who's uh, one of the people we consult with on these kind of conditions, uh, there's a blocking pattern of the mobile 
polar anticyclone and it's sending you know very warm hot weather and winds up into Alberta and you can see here there's a little branch of cold that if only it could get over the mountains and into Alberta it would probably bring rain by going up over the mountains and cooler temperatures but this blocking pattern is keeping it out and the winds are blowing crazy hard into the uh, into the actual deadwood areas. People always talk about global heating like Bill McGuire, the person I showed at the very beginning who claimed that it was global warming that was causing wildfires. But you can see on this map that there are lots of areas that are cool, cooler than normal. So, you know, people never talk about the cooler than normal areas. They only talk about the hotter than normal areas. And of course, part of the whole principle of the mobile polar anticyclone is that these areas of heat and cold are constantly sort of in a, a struggle to find balance. Um, so if it's not global warming, what else could it be? It's the mobile polar high. And as I just showed you, this is the work of uh, Marcel LaRue, who stated that there's no global warming because there's no global climate. And if we look back at this, you can see there isn't a global climate. Some places are very cold and some are very hot and some are in between. Uh, and that changes all the time. So there's not one global climate. So he discusses the um, mechanisms of the meridional ma air mass and energy exchanges. And uh, you can see more detail on this phenomena in another one of our presentations, which I'll show you toward the end. And related to this are the Rossby waves. Uh, there's a plain language discussion of that here, how stuff works. Uh, this is from uh, NOAA. And uh, Rossby waves help to transfer heat from the tropics toward the pole and cold air toward the tropics, trying to return the atmosphere to balance. They also help locate the jet stream and mark out the track of surface low pressure systems. So you see they're, they're affected, as it says here, they form primarily because of the Earth's geography, which does two things. First, the Earth's heating from the sun is uneven due to different shapes and sizes of the land mass, and that's called differential heating of the Earth's surface. And second, the air can't travel through a mountain so it must rise up and go over or go around. And so that relates to the blocking pattern that we've been experiencing. Now I just got this from uh, Ray Garnett the other day. And he was a, he's an agricultural uh, weather expert. And he has explained that La Nina has dried out the prairies. So we've had extreme dryness with 40 to 60 percent of normal precipitation in the past month and that will be a factor in the northern Alberta wildfires and we've had La Nina conditions for three years which is a bit unusual and that's likely dried out the prairies and you can see this percent of average pre precipitation very very dry. Um, also if you'd like to know more about how the sun affects extreme weather conditions and whether or not cold extremes are on the rise, you can look at Ray Garnett's presentation here, uh, which he did with uh, our scientific advisor, Dr. Madhav Kandekar. This was presented in Frankfurt, Germany last fall. So just to give you a sense that climate is cyclical, the El Nino, La Nina are two phenomena that directly affect Alberta and the Pacific Northwest. And you can see on this graph the cooler period, La Nina, that's when the surface of the ocean is cool, um, is down here. And then you can see the warmer period when the surface of the ocean is warm is up here. And you can see that it's cyclical. It's, it's not uh, cyclical in a uh, standard methodology of any kind but there are cycles of warm and cool and that directly affects, affects our climate and our fire risk conditions. So we can't do anything about that. But here are some things that we probably can do things about. Causes of wildfires. So as of May the 7th, 2023, 
In Alberta, the current wildfires by suspected cause, lightning was only 3.27%. Human causation was 43.07%, and under investigation, 53.65%. Now this is from Oregon, and this gives a kind of a long history from 1911 to 2019 of wildfires, both the uh, amount of uh, territory burned, the number of starts, um, what were human-caused fires, lightning fires, the trends, and also, interestingly enough, they also tied it to the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, uh, meaning the La Nina, El Nino, La Nina, El Nino, La Nina, El Nino phrase, phases. So you can see that there is an actual impact. Now, back in the early days, there wasn't a lot of effort made to suppress fires in the way that we do today. And we didn't have the same kind of firefighting equipment, of course. But um, just have a look at this blue line for a moment. These are human fires. So humans caused this blue line of fires and as we come here we see that it doesn't actually go away. You'd think with more and more education and better um, training it would but all these fires are caused by humans, right? This is the ratio. So it's a, it's a phenomenon that these are things that for the most part we can do something about. So here's BC Wildfire Service. This is a tweet from 2021, and they're saying that human-caused uh, wildfires were 59% sparked by people in 2020. But when we think of that, we shouldn't only think of arson, although arson is a real and significant element of wildfires. Uh, these are the reasons for human causation. This is from Cal Fire of California. Um, it's just a simple layout. That's why I like this graph. Um, and this is from 1980 to 2018. So equipment caused uh, 1,600,000 and something fires. Power lines. Now, see, this is these are both something that we can do something about. Power lines that are too close to uh, um, trees and other kinds of bushes. You know, especially on people's property or in towns and uh, rural locations, you can cut the trees back from the power lines. That makes a difference. Uh, using equipment, you know, sometimes you have sparks from different kinds of mechanical equipment, welding equipment, um, certain kinds of um, um, outdoor uh, equipment might spark and that would start a fire. Um, you can see debris burning uh, over 300,000 vehicles. Uh, that would probably be more like ATVs and dirt bikes having a spark. Camping, you know, negligent campers or people who just maybe aren't paying attention and the wind comes up and whoosh, some sparks get away. People playing with matches, kids goofing off, and smoking. So you can see that lightning is actually a very small part. You know, people often say, oh, these wildfires are caused by lightning. Well, some are, but most of these things we can do something about. And for all the people who still insist that the wildfires are caused by climate change, I want to ask you how climate change explains the 1910 wildfires in Alberta. And you can see this black area is all wildfire. And this is located on the provincial map here. So that's amazing, 1910. And also in the US at that time, there were also tremendous wildfires. In fact, uh, in the document, uh, they state that I believe it was 87 firefighters lost their lives in the US in that year, fighting these runaway wildfires. Conditions were also very dry. And that was the most number of firefighters who sadly tragically died um, until 9-11. So, uh, but there are a lot of studies done on those wildfires. People really learned a lot about fire behavior 
and um, how to properly fight it and manage it. But let's go back and see what Albertans did in 1910 to try and prevent wildfire from running away and also to protect their communities. So in the Southern Alberta wildfires of 1910, Alberta's population was only 150,000 people. Um, I think that's uh, maybe the size of Red Deer or so these days. Alberta had only been a province for five years. Fire guards were developed by plowing lines eight furrows wide and then an additional four furrows wide along the forest reserve boundaries. So they're trying to make uh, a plowed area where nothing would catch fire and fires couldn't jump from the forest that they'd if they started in the forest they would burn out and not move to the prairies or or areas where people lived and uh, the space between those furrows was maintained by harrowing and disking during the spring or fall and during wildfire suppression operations in 1910 over 40 miles of fire guard were built between Willow Creek and the Highwood River in addition to plowed guards, the fire was used to burn out guards early in the spring as the snow melted. Those would be like prescribed burns. And in 1909 alone, that being the year before, 90 miles of guards were burnt by prescribed fire along the reserve boundary, a momentous task even by today's standards. And that's certainly true. And you have to remember back then, it was horse and wagon were the common mode of transport. And again, for those who still insist, no, no, these wildfires are climate change, I want you to explain how climate change explains the 1950 Chinchaga wildfire. This was the largest fire in North American history. Um, it was 1.4 uh, million hectares or 3.5 million acres, uh, up to uh, 4.2 uh, million acres. The smoke pall from this fire actually went around the world. It caused the moon and the sun to turn blue and a lot of people really thought the end of the world had come. But it was just the smoke pall from this enormous fire. And there were actually people living up in the north area around uh, Grand Prairie high level that, and, and into the woods there uh, who actually had set up their properties so that they would survive a wildfire. It's amazing when you read this book. The book is by Cordy Timstra. Uh, he's with Alberta Wildfire and it's really a very interesting book. So back to the global news report. Uh, the media is still pumping climate anxiety instead of wildfire facts and historic evidence. Now I ask you, Having heard the things that I just explained to you about the historic evidence of wildfires and the causes of it, um, doesn't that make you feel a bit more calm? I mean, the wildfires are still scary, they're still bad, they're still out of control, but you didn't do it. And there are some things that you can do to prevent further wildfires. There are some things in your control, as I just explained. Um, and there are many things out of our control, such as the El Nino La Nina cycles. Can't do anything about that. The mobile polar anticyclone. Can't do anything about that. But we can be prepared. We can have a 72-hour kit ready to go if we have to evacuate. And we don't have to beat ourselves up thinking that, oh, you know, because I drove my car or because my parents worked in oil and gas, therefore we're guilty, you know, and we did something bad and that caused all these fires that's just not true. So I, I'm wondering why the media is pumping climate hysteria instead of trying to calm people down and give them facts and some practical things that people can do. So here Jamie Dahl of uh, Global TV is talking about Sadie Vipond saying she's been actively lobbying the government for change. Getting involved in climate action made her feel less helpless. Well, it is true if you take action on things, it does help you feel less helpless. But I would recommend making your 72-hour evacuation kit and um, um, reading some history. Now, in the same article, uh, they also had some clips with Dr. Christine Gibson, whose book has just come out, The Modern Trauma Toolkit. 
it's a bit of an ad for her. I did order a copy. Um, I think anyone who helps people calm down these days is a good idea. But she's saying that she's concerned about the eco-anxiety and its impact on younger generations because kids are afraid of having kids. Well, um, you know, again, if you look at history, uh, many people had kids in the worst possible times of the world. And those kids who survived went forward and created good and wonderful things. Um, so, as I've shown you, these wildfires are not related to something that you did. These wildfires are related to Mother Nature doing what she does. And so, I hope that it will give you some hope, some climate hope, to understand that these wildfires are driven by natural forces that are far beyond our control but there are things that we can do and if you want to have kids go ahead and have them because they're lots of fun and they're incredible little miracles and you're a miracle too because you were a kid once so I hope that uh, people can you know step out of this uh, depressive gloomy climate hysteria thinking and uh, see the world in a brighter frame. And maybe this book gives some tips on that. I hope so. I don't know. I'll find out when I get it. Now, of course, uh, Sadie is um, suing the federal government on climate change. And uh, she's a pal of um, Greta Thunberg. It's Greta and her dad, they came to visit in Calgary. That was very nice of them. Um, but in fact, taking the government to court won't stop the mobile polar anticyclone. It won't change the direction of the wind. It won't put your 72-hour evacuation kit together. Um, and it uh, won't stop El Nino or La Nina. And ironically, the climate action that uh, Sadie Vipond and her dad have been advocating for are things like wind farms, which raise regional temperatures. This is from MIT. After adding this data to the model, the researchers observed that the surface air temperature over wind farm regions increased by about one degree Celsius. <laughs> one degree Celsius. We're supposed to be keeping to the target of 1.5 degrees Celsius, aren't we? <laughs> so these are not helping us. And solar panels increase ambient temperatures. Again, this study what we found in that observational study was that the average air temperature at 1.5 meters in the photovoltaic array site was about 1.3 degrees Celsius warmer than the reference site, which is the non-photovoltaic site. And, you know, actually the federal government spending on climate change is more than $100 billion. So just imagine if some of that money was applied to clearing out deadwood cutting fire breaks around vulnerable forest communities, making flood preparations, which are also a seasonal norm. Wildfire season happens every year. So be prepared, not scared. And I wonder why we're letting the media, schools, and environmental groups terrify young people on climate change. In the Global News Report, they referred to a study of about 10,000 young adults that I think was done last year. They said that 50% of the young people feel sad, they feel angry, they feel powerless, and they feel guilty. Well, you know, if you look at the actual data, uh, in terms of world warming of one degree over the past hundred years, Canada's contribution would be 0 0.019 degrees. Celsius, which is immeasurable, and Alberta's would be 0 0.006, or six thousandths of a degree. So that's nothing to feel guilty about, and nothing to feel powerless about, although, you know, these things like El Nino and La Nina, we can't control those, but you can make your 72-hour evacuation kit, and you can stop kind of, you know, depressing yourself about human-caused climate change. And people who feel angry, you know, I notice that there are a lot of people who are very angry at, uh, at boomers. You know, I suppose it 
stems from Greta's angry outburst at the UN, you know, how dare you, you've stolen my future. Um, that's not true. <laughs> you know, we couldn't even put these wildfires out if people hadn't invented helicopters and fire bombers and all the special equipment, the Kevlar type uh, fire resistant equipment that some of the people on the ground are wearing or working with. Um, you know, these are all fabulous inventions that help us protect people and put these fires out and they're actually saving the lives and uh, property of many people and maybe they can't save everybody and maybe they can't save everyone's house or car or farm equipment. Um, again, you know, Mother Nature is very powerful so we can only do what we can do but being mad at boomers uh, you know, uh, will first of all only make you depressed because depression is anger turned inward, right? And secondly, uh, you know, you're ignoring all the great things that have been invented post-war. So it's really sad to read these statistics and think that we are crippling our future generations with climate hysteria rather than giving people facts like this and informing them about history and weather patterns. So climate change is cyclical. It's not you, it's not CO2. And, uh, you know, Greta's book is out and uh, on the cover, of course, it shows this uh, stripes, set of stripes. There's even a website called Show Your Stripes, where you can go to it, you can enter your geographic area of the country or world, and the stripes will come up. But it, these, this is like 150 years of stripes. That's not actually a very long climate record. You know, people who deal with long-term climate, like um, geoscientists, they look at 600 million years. 10,000, 12,000 years, 4.6 billion years, you know, so these short-term records are interesting but really meaningless in the whole scheme of things. So that's why when you look at this long-term 2,000 year record even, you can see there's cyclical cooling and warming, cooling, warming, cooling, warming, cooling, very cold, and warming. So of course if we're coming out of this kind of cold, of course we would have warming. That shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. And you can see it is cyclical. And why are we not teaching fire smart and basic camping safety skills in schools? Now everybody can download this fire start guide, fire smart guide. Uh, you can also find uh, fire smart for every province. If you're in the States, there's an organization called FireWise that provides similar material. So many of the basics are the same, but um, you know these are modified according to each province um, and some of the services available and some of the unique factors. So you can go online and have a look at that, but why aren't we teaching these things in school? I mean, it wouldn't be a big deal to teach it. And why isn't the media informing the public of how to reduce wildfire risks to life and property instead of blabbing about climate change all the time? So if you want to feel um, more in control of your future and reduce your risk, you can go around your house, check your yard, and recognize that the best thing to do is to move any flammable kinds of foliage away from your house. Don't leave flammable things on your deck because for the most part if a house is well maintained and the gutters don't have um, any leaves and stuff in them, the chance of, uh, of surviving a wildfire can be pretty good. Because um, if you don't give the house materials to light on fire, then it shouldn't light on fire. Now, there's a really great uh, video, uh, I think it's from the National Association of Fire Prevention in the States, and it's called Your House Can Survive a Wildfire. 
So, you know, have a look at that. It's a really interesting video. Of course, there will always be extreme conditions where that's not true. Uh, but, you know, there are many other situations where people can do things that will really help ensure that their house and valuable property are safe, as safe as possible. But again, my big beef with the media is that they could be educating people on these kinds of matters and that would be very helpful and instead they're just looking at scary headlines. So another thing that's happening right now is that there's a heat warning and um, babies, small children, the elderly and people with complex health issues are most affected by the heat. But um, I have a small tip for people you can take uh, bottles of water, probably be be better if you take uh, bigger bottles with better um, closures on them. Or maybe those um, exercise drinks, you know, like Gatorade, stuff like that, that have kind of that sipping uh, cap on them. Anyway, you can fill them with water, keep the water about an inch below, put it in the freezer, freeze it overnight. Then during the day, you can take this bottle with you. You can put it on your uh, uh, pressure points where the veins and arteries are near the surface. Uh, you can have a few of them. And as you go through the day, the water will melt and you can drink the chilly water. So you can keep yourself hydrated. You can help keep yourself cool. It's the poor man's air conditioner but I have found it helpful. Now, you know, you may have health conditions that don't warrant using that kind of method, so if you do, check with your doctor, but uh, for most of us, that would be a handy and simple way to keep cooler. If you'd like to know more about the Pacific Northwest region, um, weather patterns that affect us, you might want to have a look at Cliff Mass and his weather blog. He's got lots of interesting stuff there. And if you want to learn more about the mobile polar anticyclone or um, heat dome, we did an explainer last year. And this also uses the work of Brigitte uh, Van Vliet Lanois and her brother Jean Van Vliet. So um, if you want to know more about what happened with the Fort Mac fire, you can have a look at our uh, 2016 Ezra Levant presentation. And it's pretty amazing what he had to say back then and how it relates to now. You can also learn more about Alberta's climate and energy issues by reading our reports. So we have facts versus fortune telling. This is about Alberta's climate and weather. Uh, quite informative. It rebuts the work of Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. We have the true cost of wind and solar in Alberta. This was done by our professional engineering team. And the same for this one, what you really need to know about renewable energy that the Pembina Institute won't tell you. These are the links for those blog posts. And I will be putting this video and the PowerPoint on our blog so that you can go through and click on links if you want. And of course, if you're still concerned about climate change and convinced there's an emergency, I recommend that you go on the Clintel site, have a look at the World Climate Declaration. They explain why Mother Nature is more influential than humans and why there's no climate emergency and why we do have time. So there's more than 1,500 scientists and scholars who have signed on to the Clintel World Declaration, Climate Declaration. So I think it's important that you have a look and consider these dissenting points of view. We also have a website called Climate Change 101, which is sort of more youth-oriented, plain language. It's also bilingual. Um, so you can have a look at that and see how the sun affects climate change and some of the other factors that affect climate change. See about polar bears and sea levels. And the main point is that politicians can't stop climate change. They can't stop El Nino, they can't stop La Nina, they can't stop mobile polar anti-cyclone patterns. Um, so, you know, we should stop asking them to throw money at climate change. Ask them instead to help us with 
adaptations like fire breaks and cooling centers and um, practical things like that. Now normally at this time I'd make a big pitch for us for donations, but instead I'd like to suggest that uh, if you can, you know, donate to help the people who are evacuated and to those who have lost their homes um, or property. I mean, even if you've just been displaced for a while, uh, it's a struggle because people have lost work. Um, you know, many times your property is damaged from the smoke haze, uh, you know, it can really wreck things. Not to mention if you had your house hosed down, your house might be saved, but it probably needs a lot of renovation. So uh, if you can help people out, that would be great. I think if you go on the Alberta government website, you can see where you can donate, and what you can do. Uh, wouldn't recommend driving up there to try and help because having more people on site when you're not accounted for and you're not from the area, probably makes um, more confusion than, uh, than not. Uh, however, you know, if you are able to help at a later date, coordinate with the local authorities so that they know who's coming in. Because everybody who comes into an um, emergency area, you know, they also need food and water and place to stay and all that. So it can create an extra burden even though your best intentions are to help. So. I hope that that's given you some information about the Alberta wildfires. I hope it's given you maybe some climate hope and calmed a few people down. Uh, we're still going to be facing some difficult times ahead. I think there's going to be at least another week of this very hot weather, probably with a lot of wind. So again, be prepared. Don't be scared. Get that 72 hour kit packed up and ready to go. and. Um, Let's go forward with hope and faith. We've come through a lot in Alberta. We're going to rise again. So, for Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling. Thanks for watching.